All right, so in order to see the need for lightweight cryptography, we have to look at the evolutionary change in computing and information technologies. So in the old times, I think nobody is that old in this room, but there were one computer, but many users. So there were a lot of monitors and keyboards, but they were just terminals. When you send a command, you were actually connecting to a single computer, a huge device, and you were using it. But with the personal computers, we reached an area of one computer, one user. But today we are actually in the area of uh, uh, era of many computers and one users. And this is actually what I call IoT in a broad sense. Because now we have many computers, but I'm not only focusing on, you know, uh, laptops, desktops, and, you know, smartphones by computers. I mean, any device that has computational power, you know, like your smartwatch or even uh, smart cards in your wallet. Okay, we have a lot of computational devices, but we have a single user. So many IoT systems are on resource conference constraint platforms. For example, mobile tokens without battery, radio frequency identification cards or medical implants that do not allow change of batteries. This is important because uh, when you have a medical implant, if the battery depletes, you have to do the surgery again, right? So you need to have a system uh, that, has, that has a longer battery life. So if you put an algorithm there to provide security, it shouldn't deplete that much power. Many IoT devices are extremely cost sensitive because they are deployed in extremely high volumes. So this is very important because if, you, if the uh, production cost of a single device increases by one cent. If you are building millions of those devices, then you lose a lot of money. This is why you have to make it as cheap as possible. And for this reason, many devices come without any security. Okay. Industry needed, uh, has a need for lightweight cryptography for at least 20 years. But the problem is that it became an active research area in academia over the last 10 years, because when advanced encryption standard became a standard, the winner of the competition was the Rindell algorithm. So it, its name became AES. So we thought that as the academicians, our, all of our problems are solved. But in the industry, they started to build uh, devices like smart cards and so on. So they needed uh, smaller algorithms, but instead of, uh, contacting uh, cryptographers, they decided to build their own algorithms, okay? So industry deployed several proprietary self-made algorithms and many disasters happened, okay? Some examples are Keylog for remote keyless entry, MyWare Classic Cards for contactless smart cards. I mentioned this even in our university, we are still using MyWare Classic Cards. So if you look at Keylog, for instance, Keylock is a proprietary hardware dedicated block cipher that uses an NLFSR. This is nonlinear feedback shift register. Used for keyless entry systems like cars, garages, buildings, etc. So many companies, car companies like Chrysler, Daewoo, Fiat, etc., use this keylock algorithm. Okay, so when you press the remote button of your key, you open the your car doors. So there are a lot of attacks. Let me summarize the best attacks. There's a side channel attack and it can reveal both the secret key of a remote transmitter and the manufacturer key stored in a receiver. A remote control can be cloned from only 10 power traces allowing for a practical key recovery in minutes. So idea is as follows. When you, once you have a car and you're, you have the key, so the company that produced the car has a manufacturer key stored in the car and your transmitter also has a key, okay? So by saying that 10 power traces, you are actually measuring the power of the device once you press 10 times, okay? So this way you can recover the key in a few minutes. But uh, the thing is that the manufacturer key almost fixed in every car of that company. So capturing it only once is enough. So if you own that car, then you can get the manufacturer key without capturing any other people's keys. So once you know the manufacturer key, the secret key of a remote control can be obtained from a distance and replicated just by eavesdropping at most two messages. This means that 
if you know the manufacturer key, then somebody opens the door of their car at most two times, then just listening to that communication, you capture the transmitter key. So this is a fantastic attack, okay? Very practical. So you just stay next to the car or the person pressing the button. You gather the information with an antenna and then you know the key. So when that person is not around that car, you can just open the doors and use it. Uh, and the third attack is one of my favorite. It's not that actually as important as the previous ones, but I really like it. This is a denial of service attack. In the transmitter and the car, there is an internal counter, okay? The internal counter of the receiver, for instance, if the receiver is the garage door or the car door, uh, you just, you know, uh, reset it. So there is an attack type. You don't have to know anything. So you go to garage door or the car door and you reset that internal counter. So it doesn't match with the transmitter. So when the person comes, the pressing the button will not allow them to open their garage doors or car doors. So this is a fantastic denial of service attack. So even by walking you know, an apartment, you can just uh, reset the internal counter of that garage door and make it you know, stay closed for a very long time, okay? So this is what happens when you design your own algorithms. Designing a cryptographic algorithm is a really hard job, okay? So without consulting a cryptographer, it is really hard job. So I cryptanalyzed many algorithms, but I never designed an algorithm of my own, okay? It's not something that you can do alone, actually. Generally, nowadays we will see in some competitions, you will see algorithms that are submitted by 10 people. So you have to work in teams. Another example is A51 algorithm. So this is developed in 1987 and became a GSM standard in Europe and USA. So in our mobile phones, when we were using 2G, we were using this stream cipher, okay? And there's a deliberately weakened version A52, again, uh, developed in the same year, but it is for certain export regions. For third world countries, actually you weaken the standards so that you, it is easy to listen to them. Okay, so this algorithm was initially kept secret, but uh, since you put it in almost every device, it is easy to reverse engineer. So it was reverse engineered in 1999. So algorithm is initialized by a 64-bit key. So this is short, as you can imagine, and the publicly known 22-bit frame. And uh, it is replaced with a Kasumi block cipher, but now it is referred to as A53 after 3G. But this doesn't mean that if you are using 3G or something later, you are using something secure, okay? You may still be using A51. For instance, there is a picture I took from this uh, security research labs from Berlin. So this is GSM map project. This one from June, 2017, but even when I looked at a few months ago, it, the picture was the same. So there were some networks in Turkey. So encryption algorithm, they realized that. So this is not actually uh, covering everything. So they uh, gather voluntary data and provide these statistics from there. So this is not every communication, but they are just giving statistics from a few thousand volunteer data. As you can see, a lot of the uh, devices were still communicating with A51, but we can in real time, uh, decrypt A51 communication. So once you are, when you are calling somebody, if you are using A51, actually someone close to you or someone close to the base station you are connected to can listen to your communication. Yeah. Another disaster is my fair classic cards. This 1K means they have 1K kilobytes of memory. It was produced by NXP Semiconductor. This is one of the best actually in this area. It is used in contactless smart cards and proximity cards. Produce more than 10 billion smart card chips and 150 million reader modules. Actually, this slide is a few years old, so maybe you should double these numbers at least. And, but the problem is that they use a steam cipher that are designed by these people. It is called Crypto One. And the target applications were public transportation. So in London, the Oyster card was actually were using these cards, okay, years ago, but they have to modify it since it was broken. 
electronic toll collection, loyalty cards, event ticking, car parking, especially in Istanbul, every car parking uses this. So I checked and managed to clone all of these cars when I had the time. In some hotels, they also use this. So most people experts in this area generally clone their hotel uh, room keys so that you know they don't lose. It. So if you have an Android uh, device, you can just install a software like NFC tools. And uh, when if you have the NFC capability with your phone, when you uh, put the cards to the back of your mobile phone, you will see that uh, if it is my fair classic 1K, you will see that it is here. So it doesn't directly uh, confirm with the, this IOC standard. And here is the serial number. So this is not a secret information. Once you communicate with the card, actually it tells you what serial number it uses. Because if there are two cards in the proximity, the device needs to know which one it is talking to. So you, this is like the ID number. So you know which card is which one. But uh, the problem is that in Turkey, most of the time, the, when you open a door or you know use it to enter a company or something, they only check the serial number. So when you're walking with next to somebody, you can learn their serial number if you have an antenna and then go to their workplace and open the door or their office doors and so on. So this is a huge problem. And actually this car should not be used for important purposes. 